Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Karen Salvini with Sustainable Berkeley Lab, and I want to welcome you to this Earth Month event, uh, co-hosted by Sustainable Berkeley Lab and Earth and Environmental Sciences. <coughs> we, uh, we will be recording this session in addition to live streaming it, and it will be posted on the Earth and Environmental Sciences events page um, probably sometime next week. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim Neesty, who will be introducing our speaker. Howdy. Uh, it's my privilege today to introduce our speaker, Roger Dale. Um, first of all, I, I should tell you why I'm here. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm the hydrogeology department head, and I'm an extremely lucky person. So I really consider this a privilege to introduce our speaker today. Um, Roger is the director of the Sierra Nevada Research Institute out of the University of California at Merced. He has interests in mountain hydrology, biogeochemistry, climate impacts and water resources, and climate application. When I was a graduate student, I learned that if my advisor spoke highly of someone, I should take note of that person. And he spoke highly of Roger Bales several times. And so I did take note of that, um, with good reason. Uh, Roger's published over 140 papers. I was going to say a gross of papers, but I'm not sure that would go over very well. Um, in hydrology, glaciology, paleoclimate, atmospheric chemistry, geochemistry, and environmental engineering. Uh, he's a founding professor in engineering at the University of California, Merced. Uh, his education has gone through a bachelor's degree at Purdue, master's degree at UC Berkeley, another master's degree at Caltech, and finally a, a PhD in environmental, science, en environmental engineering science at Caltech. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of, of Science. His current work, and, and this is important, is contributing to California's efforts to both build the knowledge base and implement policies that adapt our water supplies, critical ecosystems, and economy to the impacts of climate warming. Now, his approach is uh, he has a bias towards making measurements and integrating the measurements with modeling. Uh, he works with decision makers and is working on developing climate solutions for California. And I think this is key. We all suffered through the last four plus years of drought and don't know how many more years this might be. Uh, earlier this week, there was uh, an article in the New York Times. And if you're interested in finding that, uh, Betsy McGowan has posted it, posted the link. Um, you go through our spam mail that we get every day um, today at Berkeley Lab and look for the, uh, the, the mention for today's uh, speaker. You can find the, the link for that. Um, and and I, find this, I found this really impressive. I looked through the article. I looked at the pictures. Um, you know, we've all seen the guy who goes out and measures California snow carries the, the big steel tube around and sticks it down in the snow and pulls it up and weighs the snow. And then you fly over the Sierra and you, you say, really? You know, really? What does this mean? And uh, Roger has a, a, a more broad-based um, bias towards making measurements that, that help understand the system so that these uh, measurements can be used. Uh, what I found really impressive, though, is that he can hang out in the Sierras, go hiking, go snowshoeing, and call it work. Uh, he told me that he loves interacting with people on subjects like this. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Roger Bales to talk about water security in a changing climate, California drought, and Sierra Nevada response. Please welcome Roger. Thank you so much, Tim, and thanks for the invitation to, to John and, and colleagues for uh, inviting me to talk about some of my uh, favorite subjects and, and, and passions. I just st wanted to start, since this was billed as an uh, Earth, Earth Month or pre-Earth Day talk, to, to say I'm, I'm really excited about what's uh, supposed to happen on Earth Day next uh, week, next week. Uh, that the U.S. and Chinese presidents will be signing the Paris, uh, the results of the, of the Paris Agreement. It should be a, 
momentous Earth Day. I'm going to talk about things a little bit more close to home today, uh, on a little bit on California's water future, some of our findings uh, embedded in some other comments about my views on where we are and, and where we may be uh, headed. When we think about the drought, this is one of the images that uh, comes, to, comes to mind. We can go back to 2010, which, you know, 2011 was the really wet year, but 2010 wasn't bad. Uh, this is, uh, you know, April 1st is the, the canonical date for the peak snowpack in the Sierra Nevada historically, although that's changing. Uh, and so looking at the, at the best uh, NASA cloud-free scene uh, close to that date, we see that you know, 2015 was you know, a really uh, light year. 2016, it, it's, it's still uh, a, little, a little thin out there. We're not out of the drought at, at this point, although we're certainly better than we were last year. So that's one of the canonical images. I think you've probably seen images uh, like this, too, pointing out the amount of storage. Of course, Lake uh, Oroville is uh, much fuller than this uh, now and spilling, uh, probably spilling water in anticipation of, uh, to provide capacity for flood storage should there be another storm. So this is really what I want to talk about today. I'd like to give a little context for California hydrology and, and, uh, and water resources. I know some of you know that, but I think there's others that probably don't uh, uh, encounter some of the hydrologic issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And so let me, let me just continue through that. Uh, I turned California on, the, on its side here, not so water would drain to San Francisco Bay uh, downhill, but uh, more just to fit it on the, on the slide. But uh, I just wanted to point out that two things here. Uh, when we look at the total height of these bars is the average annual precipitation for river basins going from north to south in the Sierra Nevada. So we have quite a, a decrease in precipitation as you go north, or if you live south, like you say, it's an increase as you go north. And then the height of the intermediate bar is P minus Q, which is roughly water use by vegetation, evapotranspiration. And most of the evapotranspiration is transpiration by the forest as opposed to evaporation, although they both contribute to it. What, one thing we notice is these, these uh, green bars are you know, more similar as you go south to north than uh, is the precipitation, meaning we have about the same density of forest and vegetation across the Sierra Nevada which is another reason why we get less runoff. That is, the runoff signal is amplified by the fact that we have these forests. More about that as, as we go. And then, of course, the other thing is to notice the, you know, the extensive uh, colored lines on here, which is how we re redistribute water around the state from the source areas to the use. One other point about this north to south gradient in the Sierra Nevada, when you replot that instead of north to south, but by the average temperature of the basin. I say relative to the Kings River Basin because that's the highest elevation overall basin in the Sierra Nevada. And P minus Q or evapotranspiration, the Kings has the lowest evapotranspiration in part because it's high elevation. Why would it? Why does that matter? Well, the trees shut down in the winter. And uh, McCalmney has the lowest elevation and, and the highest, uh, or almost the highest. There's some variation here, but yeah. So that, and then when you look at that same slope, that's what you get out of estimates for climate warming, too. So as we warm, these basins will basically just, we're talking about just shifting the line. Uh, so that, you know, I don't necessarily need a climate model for that sort of projection, but it, it's, it's more intuitive just based on, 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 on the data. And when evapotranspiration goes up with warmer temperature, that means the partitioning of precipitation, if, if precipitation doesn't change, that means runoff goes down. So my basic equation I'm working with here is precipitation equals evapotranspiration plus runoff. Okay, so that was the hydrology uh, 101 uh, overview here. The other piece of that on mass balance is, and uh, 
you know, one of the things that we've been working toward is a better water accounting system for California disaggregated in space and time. But on total, you know, we get about 200 million acre feet. Sorry for the traditional units, but that's what, that's what the, you know, uh, that, that's what everything is reported in, you know, an acre a foot, a foot deep, uh, acre of water a foot deep. Precipitation on average is about 200 million. Applied water is about 80, meaning w the difference between those is water that uh, is, is consumed in the headwater basins, but, you know, by largely consumed in the headwater basins or runs off without, uh, w without being applied. So the applied water use is split is uh, about 80 ag, out of that the ag 33, the urban eight, that's the bottom half of this pie chart. The top part is the aquatic environment, wild and scenic rivers, uh, especially the north coast uh, and so forth, required delta outflows. So when you talk, when we talk with uh, water managers in the San Joaquin Valley, they like to report agriculture not as 41%, but as, as basically half of that because the 41, well, I mean, uh, as the 41%, not double that. Whereas per water supplies, you see the number 80%. So this is, you know, just public conversations are very important. And sometimes we can't even agree on is agriculture 80% of the bottom half of this or 41% of the whole circle. Now, how do we, how do we view future supplies? Well, if you're in the uh, you know, ag business, you say, well, this top of the pie may be a little too big. We should move some of that to the bottom half. Another avenue, though, is to look at the difference between this 120 and the 80, and I want to comment on that. Or the 200 and the 80, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about groundwater, but just to, I put this in just to say that our, although I've worked in the Sierra Nevada, and that's, I consider that my, my laboratory uh, with, in collaboration with colleagues from other campuses, we're really trying to look at the full picture from headwaters through groundwater and water consumption at this point, because these different systems, headwaters, groundwater, uh, water distributed, they've been managed separately, and where the state is trying to provide incentives and we need to manage them as a system. Okay, moving uh, from the basic hydrology and water resources into a few drought issues. Uh, here in the west, in semi-arid west, we talk about drought originating from a deficiency of precipitation over extended period of time, usually multi-year. Whereas if you're talking about a drought and, you know, Jim Hunt lives in North Carolina, they talk drought is, is you know, two weeks without rain, right? In the, in, in the east. Okay. Uh, so uh, California has had five multi-year dry periods since 1970. Uh, 10 of large scale extent since 1915. And just another uh, point on our precipitation, this shows snow accumulation at some of our sites in, in Wolverton. The black line is the average of several different sensors that are out there. But, and basically this shows three, four, five, five main storms. That's not unusual. I mean, that's, that's fairly common. We get our mountain precipitation in just a few storms each, each year. So if you, basically one per month. If you, so if you miss those, like in, in uh, water year 2014, 15, we got one of those five. So it's not surprising that, we're in, that we had you know, a very bad uh, drought. Drought develops over time. The dark colors over here, it Dark brown and red, it, red colors indicate the most extreme and exceptional drought. So the drought, November or 2011 was a really, was uh, coming off of a wet year. And it took until about 13, 14, 15, where the index used here 
is an amalgam of uh, precipitation and temperature and re reflects how much moisture is available, you know, soil moisture, uh, moisture availability is uh, one way to think about it. So uh, as early as recently as November, still in the exceptional drought. And this is the most recent drought index. We can see the, we're still, although part of the, part of the mountains are, have been moved from exceptional to severe, <laughs> but that, 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 that isn't that comforting. <laughs> Okay, and, and one more thing about these droughts. I, I like this figure from a, a paper by, uh, by Mann and, and, and Glick. It shows on these axes uh, uh, precipitation from low to high over the uh, instrumental record, temperature from low to high. 2014 was exceptional. That is, we're into a, a, a regime of Warmer temperatures, lower precipitation. Warmer temperatures means more evaporative demand. And so that affects that overall water balance that I mentioned earlier also. 2015 was a little bit to the right, I believe. I, I didn't get to add that to the, to the graph here. And I highlighted in yellow all the years since 2000. So yeah, we know the climate is changing, and, and uh, it's changing faster than the model projections in many cases. Uh, and just one more point on the uh, drought perspectives. This is a 1,100-year paleoclimate record based on tree rings, where the horizontal line would be the uh, median. I've shaded the, the periods that are four years or longer, you know, honoring the four years of the dry we've had here. So there's, a, there's, there's on average a couple of those per century. And, and I think that you know, the Department of Water Resources commissioned this study by Dave Miko and colleagues from the Tree Ring Lab in Arizona. Uh, and these, this provides yet another, more scenarios to think about infrastructure planning, water rights, and so forth uh, for, for California. So I'll come back to that. Okay, uh, this photo is, is from uh, the King Fire, uh, King Fire, uh, no, this is American Fire, sorry, yeah. American Fire uh, uh, area, uh, where we've been getting these stand replacing wildfires and I wanna talk about disturbance in the Sierra Nevada, which is some of our own research embedded in the middle of this uh, uh, broader talk here and, the, and the, the effect of disturbance on the water cycle. When, uh, when my uh, colleague and spouse Martha Conklin and I joined UC Merced in 2003, we set out to use the Sierra Nevada as our laboratory. I'd been working in the Sierra Nevada for several years, but mostly doing modeling and using other people's data and was surprised about how few measurements and what limited understanding of the water cycle there was in the Sierra Nevada. I thought we knew precipitation in the Sierra Nevada, but, knew, but realized we did not know evapotranspiration across the Sierra Nevada. I later found out we don't actually know precipitation either in, in much of the Sierra Nevada. And we do know runoff from the major rivers. Uh, at, at least uh, we measure runoff and we sort of have an idea of the diversions upstream of the runoff. Uh, so we have established several, these circles are where we've been doing field-based research. I wanna focus on this transect of the Southern Sierra Critical Zone Observatory. The circle is heavily intense, heavily instrumented watersheds and, uh, whoops, and the solid dots are where we have eddy correlation, eddy covariance flux towers and uh, soil moisture and other things like that to, to locally measure the the water balance. So they extend from uh, Wolverton, that was where the, the snow depth measurements earlier I showed you, in Sequoia National Park, just above Giant Forest, up through uh, the American River Basin. And, and 
these have been associated with forest management studies and, and process level understanding of, of the water cycle and, and other uh, aspects of the critical zone. So some of the questions motivating the research I'm talking about now, and, and you know, there's a zillion questions out there, but you know, basically the basic question is why do we have the forest that we do <laughs> in the Sierra Nevada? And um, how has this forest coped with, no, with drier than normal years before, multi-year dry periods before? And maybe why isn't it coping now? Uh, how, and then how do forest density regulate water storage? So it, we have the forest that we do in, you know, in, in part because of the climate, temperature, precipitation, but also storage. As I'll emphasize, for, for societies around the world, storage is, is really key to water security. It is for the forest, too, in, in semi-arid regions. It needs storage because of the variable uh, climate. And that should this should the ongoing mortality in the forest is this is this is this uh, drought related or are there uh, uh, and is it related to forest management of the last century the fire suppression policies of the past century which gave us these overgrown forests or is it just a natural cycle? So uh, here's the first. Uh, uh, now here's another uh, graph of our data, one of a uh, few. So water year day, sorry for the water year, but I put the months at the top here. We start in October for the water year. So uh, this is the cumulative evapotranspiration measured by two flux towers for two different years. 2011, a really wet year. Notice this, this soap root site, which is in the rain zone, the lower uh, 1,100 meters. and uh, Providence, which is in the you know in the rain snow transition, where you get about 50% rain, 50% snow. Uh, we have you know about over a meter of evapotranspiration. So fruit uh, drops off significantly in the uh, third year of the drought, and it went even dropped even. Well, it was about the same in 2015 actually. But it's it, it's looking pretty bad right now, uh, and I'll show you why in a minute. So uh, and but at um, Providence, much smaller drop off there. Providence has more precipitation and actually more storage, and so forth. So it has a lot of storage too. Okay, and and then gross CO2 uptake sort of followed that. Uh, why did it drop off at Soaproot? Well, this is. Uh, Matrix potential measured at uh, two meter depth. That is, uh, low values mean dry. There's no, you know, there's not much water there. There's more suction in the soil, and high values means it's it's wetter. So uh, each year it it dries out as uh, you know. There's water in the soil, and it the water goes to two two places. One it is taken up by the vegetation and put back in the atmosphere due to transpiration. Second, it drains by gravity to provide the base flow in the streams. So it's a you know, competition between gravity and, 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 and trees. And so it dries out. It wets up again when, in, when there's rain and snow melt, dries out in the summer and fall, and so forth. Uh, at Sofruit, the water didn't get down to two meters, <laughs> or not much water got down to two meters. So if you look at the top meter of the root zone in these forests, that dries out you know, a month or six weeks or so after the snow is gone, or after the rain stops. And the trees just move deeper or further out, but there was no water there. Uh, because of the lack of recharge. So they... Uh, so there's, there's mortality. And the soil, we measured soil moisture also, and that showed basically the same pattern. Uh, now, I want to scale this across the landscape, because this is a flux tower. It has about a one uh, kilometer footprint. We're measuring 
the evapotranspiration on that you know, upwind one kilometer footprint. How do we scale that across the landscape? Well, annual evapotranspiration measured by flux towers correlates really well with, uh, with vegetation index NDVI measured by uh, MODIS uh, satellite. I think this uh, R squared of 0.9 is really good. We can take out some of the data points and get it even better. Uh, so this is about, I think, 50 site years. So each of these points is one year's worth of evapotranspiration from the flux tower and then taking uh, NDVI measurements. So that gives us an opportunity then to use the MODIS NDVI to scale it across the landscape. And that's what this figure shows. Then the estimate of annual evapotranspiration for the Kings River Basin, high, uh, high values uh, in uh, sort of mid-elevations and lower values at lower and higher elevations. So uh, conceptually, I think that makes sense because higher leaf area index, are high, you know, there's more biomass, higher evapotranspiration, more productivity, and thus higher NDVI. So this is not really the actual, but it's, it's the evapotranspiration that the amount of vegetation that's out there is expecting to get. And if it doesn't get that, it'll die <laughs> or, or senesce. But, yeah. And when we uh, look at that, this uh, middle panel then shows an average of that scaled across the landscape for pre-drought and post-drought uh, years. And we see that up through 2015, when we scale that across the landscape, it, it actually uh, didn't change that much except at these mid-elevations where it, it dropped off uh, during, the, during the drought. So it, it reaches a peak here in the 1,500 to 2,000 meter elevation. We call that the happy zone for, for trees because it's not too dry. There's uh, plenty of precipitation during most years. This top is elevation versus precipitation. 2011, a really wet year. Uh, and then into the, into the drought years. So the middle zone is uh, it's not too cold in the winter and it's not too dry in the summer. Evapotranspiration drops off at high elevations because it's too cold in the winter. And it drops off at lower elevations because there's not enough water. It's used up earlier in the season. So when you take the difference between these two, you can see that uh, pre-drought years we're still drawing from storage to, at some elevations, but uh, during the drought years, these values P minus ET is negative, implying that most of the water, quite a bit of water is coming from storage to sustain the vegetation during those years until you get up you know, above 2,500 meters or so. And that's fine as long as the water is there in storage, but turns out it wasn't there in storage for some of these elevations. And one more graph on that, taking this P minus, or this um, P minus ET line for 2014, which shows uh, it drops off the, the most around, around this 1500, lowest around this 1500 meter elevation, that correlates with uh, a satellite, another uh, index called a normalized burn ratio, which is used from the satellite, which is used to, as an in index of, of wildfire disturbance, but it's also, I think, useful for drought disturbance. So it's basically showing uh, dead trees, and that also correlates well with aerial surveys done by the uh, Forest Service in counting the dead trees. So that, that's where the mortality uh, was the greatest. And so we're explaining this drought as being a water-driven drought as opposed to the temperature-driven droughts in the Rockies. And you know, water or, or temperature either can provide the, the stress and the uh, conditions for bark beetles and anything else to then do their thing and, and kill the trees. OK, and, and so this is a photo that I took in June uh, in that area where the near the soap root 
looking down toward the so fruit uh, site, tree die off was greatest where, uh, again, recharge to the deeper root zone was limited. It's hazy because there was fire. There were no clear days last summer to get a good picture. <laughs> uh, and then six months later, this is what it looked like. So the mortality actually happened during the second, you know, the latter part of 2015. Uh, I had a, a professional photographer go out and take some more uh, photos when it was, there wasn't any smoke, but it was still cloudy. So that's, we, we have 100% mortality, I think, at this point near the Sofruit Flux Tower. Overall, it may be only be 20% or so across the Sierra Nevada, but we just happen to be in the area with the greatest mortality. So that, uh, that's going to change the runoff this year. We, we, sh we will get more runoff this year because of the mortality and less evapotranspiration. Now, this is what my silviculture colleagues tell me it was more like a historical forest from 100 years ago based on surveys that were done then. In the background is the current not thin forest in the foreground. So this is, this is uh, what we're talking about in terms of forest restoration that both reduces fire risk, that is uh, this forest in the foreground is much less susceptible to a high intensity wildfire that is a crown fire. The fire should stay on the ground as it goes through there versus in the background, that's, that's gonna get a crown fire. <laughs> as long as it's warm, hot conditions, hot, dry conditions. Uh, and if you look at historical photos from the Sierra Nevada, Yosemite in 1899, Yosemite in 1961, 1994, you can see there's several paired photos like this where a of areas that had not been subject to disturbance prior to the first photo being taken. So we, uh, there's both anecdotal and survey data showing that we have about double the biomass, in many cases, five, six times the number of trees now as were there uh, prior to uh, the fire suppression policies of the uh, Congress and, and federal government on, on these managed lands. Okay, that's, a, that's my uh, story on drought. Uh, I wanna get down toward water security, but just a couple comments on drought impacts uh, to, to bring this together with what's in the valley, the Central Valley. Uh, this is a USGS scientist, uh, Michelle Sneed, showing where the uh, land surface was in 1988, 2013. Maybe you've seen other pictures of this. As you extract groundwater, you can get inelastic, inelastic compression of the sediments and, and uh, you can recharge the groundwater, but you won't raise the land surface back up here. And uh, drought impacts, we, California has a lot of storage to help us get through droughts, but yet the storage benefits some people and not others. So when we think about water management, there's both economic efficiency and equity issues that we need to deal with there. And you know, if you're an irrigation district, such as these, I downloaded these data from Westlands, which is the largest irrigation district and probably the most modernized irrigation district in the Central Valley. And these blue bars during wetter years show that most of their water comes from the Central Valley project, which is basically water from Shasta. It passes through the Delta, then goes to the Central Valley project. During dry years, they shift to groundwater and fallow land bars aren't as high, so they uh, shift to groundwater and, and some land is, is fallow. Now, you know, behind, cl behind closed doors, I think most people in the ag industry would acknowledge that some land may have to be fallowed over the long term in order to meet the water balance. Right now, it is happening during droughts, but the overpumping of groundwater relative to what can be replenished is also so finally, uh, water security. So we have infrastructure such as these aqueducts that 
move water around the state. We have storage. Uh, when I think of water security, I think of these three I's. Infrastructure, both green and gray infrastructure, built infrastructure and our natural infrastructure. I think of st strong institutions, and California is trying to move toward uh, regional cooperation. Water decisions are made locally. That's how California was established, and that's how it, it, it's still written into the state water plan, that water decisions are made locally, yet there are incentives for regional cooperation. Incentives for cooperation between headwaters and groundwater and water users, but not any move towards central control. But to me, the real, really the foundation of water security is better information, the third eye of that. That is, we're operating a lot of our water systems by the seat of our pants these days or with, with limited data, and that served us well in many cases. And we're moving into a, an era of greater stress on our system as population increases, land use changes, and, and so forth, climate warm. So, uh, California has probably the most secure water supply system of any semi-arid region in the world. And yet, it's not enough to support the economy and, and the uh, populations that we are, have and are expecting. And water security really lies at the heart of our adaptation to climate change. We're going to have to adapt to the climate change that we don't prevent. Um, so looking historically at California, we know that you know, water started out as being very important for the resource extraction industry. We built levees along all the rivers and so forth to help wash the sediment out of the mountains from the mining areas. And then we got agriculture, and we started building dams to provide seasonal storage and over-year storage, a little bit of over-year storage. Then when uh, pumps became uh, available, we started pumping deeper groundwater. And this figure from the state water plan indicates that we're moving into a sustainable resource management era, in some cases. <laughs> uh, but, and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, passed by the legislature in 2014, could change everything and really push us toward that sustainable management. If, if the intent of the legislature is carried out, that folks at DWR know that's going to change everything they do or most many things that they do. How they Yet we have some big questions that, that we may have settled with, with the passage of Sigma, but there's going to be, these are going to be continuing questions. That is, depletion versus sustainability of our groundwater. What is sustainability? Does that we mean we provide the same amount of groundwater for our future generations as we have now? Or does that mean we sustain some level of activity? Is the is the sustainable level of groundwater empty, or full, or halfway? There's still some latitude within Sigma to to decide that. You know, in some parts of the U.S. or parts of the world, people have decided, okay, we'll pump the groundwater completely down, and that's it. What's the level of sustained supply? That is, are we going to try to provide this level of supply, the same level of supply every year, whether there's drought or wet period? If so, we're going to have to ramp up our storage. Storage with a capital S, not just dams, but we can try to improve the health of our snowpack storage and our soil water storage, as well as make use of groundwater storage without increasing our greenhouse gas footprint. <laughs> So these are some big questions that we still have to weigh in on and find ways to address. Water rights. We know that water is over-appropriated in California. Senior water rights get water first. Yet there's the reasonable and beneficial use clause in the Constitution that provides some latitude for interpretation of how water is allocated. 
Now, you want to talk about full employment for lawyers, let's get into that. <laughs> that's, that's where you go. Uh, other big questions, yeah, so big questions, allocation decisions. Should reasonable and beneficial use be more narrowly defined for what the water is used for? These are big questions that I think the state will, or what beneficial uses should be provided? Are we got, is a beneficial use of Central Valley aquifers drinking water? If it is, we're, we're still quite a ways from meeting that because it doesn't meet drinking water standards because of the residues from our economic activities. Are we gonna clean that up? And the same question is faced by states across the country that have contaminated their groundwater so that they cannot necessarily serve as drinking water supplies. Los Angeles faces that. They want to use the aquifer under the San Fernando Valley for seasonal storage, but yet it's full of chemicals from manufacturing. And they're going to be there no matter how many you know, times you flush it out. <laughs> um, so the more decisions. So the state water plan provides some uh, comprehensive data. The action plan provides priorities. Where do we make our societal investments? Green infrastructure, do we restore our forests, provide groundwater recharge, do we build more dams, or some combination thereof? So there's many more implementation and operational decisions beyond that, that uh, there are you know, many knowledge gaps, and such as, but my really main, uh, I think, uh, what I think would help the most at this moment is just having better water information and accounting, knowing how much water is out there, how much water is going here, there, and so forth. For example, we're still measuring snow, uh, reporting snow the same, you know, not that we were 100 years ago in most cases. We can do better. And we're not measuring. When, I, when, I, when Martha and I started putting soil moisture measurements in the Sierra Nevada, we could count how many measurements that were on the fingers of one hand. Now we have a few hundred sensors out there, and the, and the state would like to see you know, more measurement systems. The cost of doing these measure, distributed measurements has gone down tremendously in the last decade, and the reliability has gone up. And the maturing of satellite data helps even more. So we've started instrumenting at the basin scale this American River Basin, putting in instrument clusters that can provide distributed data on water balance. I won't really go into that, but just to say that if, you, if you're good with a sh shovel and a wrench and you want to work in the field, why come join us next summer? <laughs> and uh, we have these modular systems. Um, so I, I think, you know, modern water information system is really the key to water management here. And the, the next step, I mean, we can, Australia spent, what, one or $200 million on a water information system during the millennial drought. I think our economy is probably bigger than Australia's, and it, I think the payoff would be pretty, 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 uh, pretty quick. So I'll I'll end with that. Uh, yeah, this is the maximum snowpack in I think 2014 and 2011. It was up above these people's heads at our critical zone observatory site. So thanks for your attention. And Questions. Um, we have two roving mics. We'd like to get the questions on the microphone so they end up in the live stream. So, anyone have questions? In the back, okay. Can you comment on your philosophy on fire suppression and, and how the forest should be managed? Yeah, you, if you got it, if you got all day. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, my, I, I really ag agree with my silviculture colleagues that um, patchy uh, forest stands, meaning on uh, cooler north-facing slopes, leave habitat because we can't, well, we, we can't just thin the forest because there's many ecosystem services we get from the forest. On hotter south-facing slopes, that's where you may thin the forest more, where the fire risk is higher. 
But also, I'm not sure that these historical densities are sustainable in the future because of the higher evaporative demand. So I, don't, I think we're in an adaptive management framework where we need to try doing the restoration treatment and then evaluating. Um, yeah, so my question is, what, what's your thought on sort of collecting and storing water uh, in urban areas? Like, do, does that help or hurt? That helps, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if you look at the city of Los Angeles at their plan for, you know, the next several years of, of water supply, they're looking at developing more local storage through, you know, capturing storm water and recharge. But you look at their supply side, and there's still a part of their bar charts that say, you know, water from other sources on there. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we've, we've got to do urban, urban storage, more urban storage. More storage south of the delta, more storage south of the Tehachapi's for the high water demand part of the state. So I was intrigued by you. You made reference to the idea of sort of um, what in the energy world people would call demand side management. So when in years when you have lower supply, you would actually reduce the amount. You know, th and there is some of this what fallowing of fields and that sort of thing. In the energy world, that's mostly managed through prices. So you have prices of energy, that, and then people respond with their demands accordingly. What would be the institutional mechanism uh, to implement that? Uh, on the water side, I wonder. Well, I've, I've been at meetings with the, uh, the legal counsel for Westland's Water District, and he always car carries a checkbook with him just in case he encounters a rice farmer willing to sell their, their water north of the delta. Then they have to figure out how to get it through the delta. There's a, there's a sort of a market out there now. I think a better water information system will help that market. I mean, I, I think we need to bring private sector investments to things like headwater management and though and that uh, can provide more supply in at least wet and average years but we need verification of the benefits uh, of that and also for water banking and groundwater storage right now the water banks groundwater storage is run somewhat informally. You sort of have an idea of how much recharge is occurring, but not exactly, and how much you can, you can pump back out. So again, uh, I, 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 I think that, that those markets will develop based on better information, or will be supported based on better information. It seems like we're on the cusp of another water war like they had at the turn of the century. And what do you think the appetite is for making really big decisions about um, our, wa our water future? Do you think that there is an appetite to either decide that we're going to have canals up and down all of California, or that we're going to say, no, some areas really, it's not appropriate to be getting that amount of water? I think, I think it would be a big decision if we started changing the water rights system and that I don't know what's going to stimulate that maybe it would take a 12-year drought but if you look in the paleoclimate record that has happened <laughs> in the last uh, millennium before but a, a longer drought will probably put some people out of business and that that may make it that may make it um, more feasible to do some uh, longer longer term reallocation in terms of a water war, I, I think it's going to be fought you know, econ economically at, at this point. We have to find a way to take care of the equity issues too, though. Uh, if we can't do it, I don't know who can. If we can't do it here in California, I don't know, uh, I don't know who can. I, I, again, I think the really foundation for that is better education and information. There needs to be some better capacity building in the regional decision making. Uh, you know, I think of a conversation I had with a, a congressional aide yesterday, and I realized that he he sort of understands that water flows downhill, but not too much beyond that. <laughs> I, you uh, 
you made extensive discussion about um, about the distribution of water uh, within the Central Valley, and I was wondering what your thoughts are on the wisdom or lack thereof of the Twin Tunnels project and uh, of the prospects of that happening. Isn't the governor staking uh, quite a bit of capital on getting the Twin Tunnels project moving forward? You know, I, I don't study the Delta, but I'll accept the opinions of my, or the findings of my colleagues at UC Davis who do that. They say if, if you want to tr try to meet the co-equal goals for the Delta, that is restored habitat, uh, still farming in the Delta, and export of water from the Delta, then you need the twin tunnels because there's just too many other risks that could set aside two of those three two other, many other scenarios. I think the money is there to pay for the twin tunnels. There's still some people that would like to stop it. So you, I think you started out with uh, your basic hyd hydrology 101 with uh, runoff plus evapotransportation equals precipitation. Throughout the talk you discussed storage and the amount of time like you showed the drought maps every year took several years for a certain mm -hmm. storage yep. to be depleted so how I'm, I'm curious does that you know initial basic equation does it really hold and how do you deal with this storage element over time um, in these systems yeah it it holds it holds over it holds over those all time scales. I mean, uh, we can do a water balance. If we do a water balance on the Sierra Nevada, for example, the to on an, in an average year, the total snowpack storage plus soil water storage is about equal to the water stored behind the dams. But yet there's some time that it takes to release that. The snowpack is released over a few weeks, the soil water storage over multiple years there. Um, the same thing on the groundwater. Right now, we're overdrafting our groundwater on average over the long term about what one or two million acre feet per year something something like that so that means unless we start doing more recharge we're going to have to do less pumping over the long term now in in conjunctive use you do expect to pump groundwater during those dry years so but we have to have a mechanism to recharge them during the wet years, so yeah, I, I think, I think it, I think it applies, and I think we can do it. It's just that, right now, it's like having a checking account, and you keep taking more money out than your, than is coming in the other end. And even my kids can't do that. Do you think that California can solve its own problems, or given the number of stakeholders and historical water rights, that the federal government has to get involved? Within a flawed constitution for the state, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of problems that maybe. No, I, I think we're, I, I think we're more able to solve our problems than than the federal government at this point. But there are some key areas where the federal government can help us, such as assistance programs for groundwater recharge. We're seeing innovative solutions, I think, or you know, good solutions where farmland is used to capture flood flood peak flows and flood either uh, vineyards or uh, 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 tree crops for a week or two. It doesn't hurt the, hurt the, uh, the vegetation, the water inf areas where water infiltrates. We need more w money to build the, the, the levees and so forth to divert the water into those areas. And I think um, you know, the, the farmers can't necessarily finance them themselves. They need state and federal assistance. So things like that. I think small areas uh, like that, we, we need better state-federal partnerships. I actually wrote an op-ed on that a while back, yeah. Hi, you seem to imply that Australia has spent money on a more substantial data sensor system. And I'm curious to know what that's bought them in terms of what they can understand about their water system that we don't and how that's influenced their ability to manage it. My understanding is that they've improved their both flood forecasting and water supply, uh, water supply mass balance, which supports their decision making. I haven't 
I don't know to what extent they've gone into the soil moisture, the subsurface water balance, but I think they've at least improved the surface water balance and the ability to translate data into usable information for a wide range of stakeholders. So that, that last thing is critical because we have a lot of data coming in, but it's not actionable information. So I, I think just the data system itself can be quite expensive. And I don't know if I answered your question. I don't know the details of the system, but I've heard some talks. Uh, very informative talk. Uh, I was curious, what do you suspect or how do you think we will augment our diminishing snowpack supplies uh, in the coming future due to climate change? Well, if you're losing snowpack storage, that means, and, and you want to capture the water for some beneficial use other than flowing out through the, the delta, then you need to have some, some other storage. And that's where... Uh, restoring floodplains and ag lands and so forth, using ag lands for groundwater infiltration can come into play. But we need to do that in an energy smart uh, way because we have to extract the water. Anytime you pressurize water, you're putting energy into it. So can we do that with renewable energy? I mean, th there are levees along basically all the rivers coming out of the Sierra Nevada and they're, they're right near the levee. Again, some of my colleagues at Davis and other places have studied the impact of moving those levees out to give a bigger floodplain. Obviously, that flood, floods ag land, and it it can provide a, you know a, a societal payoff at the expense of the land owner. So we need to find you know compensatory mechanisms for that. I think we have plenty of land, and land use is the next thing that needs to come in to the water planning. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I teach the water resources class both at UC Merced and UC Berkeley for, for graduate students. And I, I think we're in an era of not, you know, focusing so much on gray infrastructure as more uh, earth science engineering. Yeah. How, can we manip how can we manipulate land use in a way that meets multiple goals? Hi. Um, OK. Uh, I don't know much about wastewater treatment, but what about, do you think it's economically feasible to go from maybe primary to secondary treatment to be reusing some of the water or? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I don't know much about it these days either, but I back in a former life, I did work on water reclamation before I got my, my, PH, my PhD in, in Southern California. And it's, it's been going on in California for quite a while. I, I read that the city of Los Angeles is building, has commissioned to build a, a large water reclamation plant. So right now their treated wastewater effluent is going out into the ocean. They're going to try to treat that to a higher level and pump it back up in, into the city. So it must be economically feasible. And I think it is because I, I can't see that costing any more, maybe less than desalination which is, you know, costs a little bit more than pumping water over the Tehachapis to the Central Valley and to Los Angeles. Again, just think in terms of any time you have to pressurize water, that's the main cost, is uh, the, the main energy cost. The energy is the main cost of, of producing that water. Thank you.